Hello, today is May 26, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. And we are privileged to have with us today Warren Griffin. Welcome, Warren. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Boston. Uh, October 1949. And you currently live where? In Holliston. And your marital status? Uh, married. And do you have children? Yes. How many? Two. And did you grow up in Boston or in another town? I grew up in Boston uh, until the sixth grade and then we moved out to Natick. So you grew up in Natick? Right. And did you graduate from Natick High School? Class of 67. Very, very proud of that fact. And where, what area did you grow up in? West Natick. What is Natick like today versus what it might have been like growing up? I think Natick has changed a little bit with um, the, uh, I don't want to say the yuppie mentality, but uh, more or less the yuppie mentality. That uh, It's become a little bit uh, upper middle class as opposed to being middle class. Or blue collar. I hear from a number of individuals who have grown up in Natick that it was a hardworking blue collar town. Did you do you agree with that? Yes, yes. And did you go to elementary school or middle school or I went actually to, junior high? I came into uh, Natick in the sixth grade, so I went to Brown School, and then Wilson Junior High, up to ninth grade, and then we moved to uh, into the high school. Do you still keep in contact with friends from Natick? Yes, yes. I do a lot of my volunteer work. It is all Natick geared. So there's still a fondness for the oh, town. Oh, definitely. I, uh, I love Natick. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered in uh, Natick, I'm sorry, in Framingham. The recruiting office was in Framingham in August of 1968. Why? Why did you join? Well, the Tet Offensive had happened in late January, early February of 1968. And I felt there was a commitment, at least on my part, to um, help out the country in the war in my own little way. My family has had a pretty good tradition with uh, fighting in the wars. My great-grandfather fought in the Civil War. My father fought in World War II, and I felt that the country was at war now, and it was my duty almost to go and serve the country. Now, you had already graduated from Natick High. Right. And what were you doing between graduation in 67 and August in 68? I was a student at Framingham State. So you made the decision to leave school. Right. What? branch did you join? The Marine Corps. And why did you choose the Marines? As a young boy I always was fascinated by the Marines. In junior high I wrote to the Marine recruiter and wanted to know how I could become a Marine and did they have a parachute uh, unit that I could join. And the recruiter was very happy to return a letter to me and then call the house to see how I like the material that he sent me. And my mother was very upset, said he's in seventh grade or eighth grade. Don't ever call this house again. He's never going into the Marines, so don't even bother coming around here again. And she said, why would he do that? And I told her, I said, I wrote away and asked him for some information. So she said, don't ever do that again. So you were always fond of the, the whole Marines. concept of the Marines. Yes. Did any of your family or friends join with you or around the same time? Uh, they did, but I found out about that later on. Um, I joined by myself. And once you joined, where did you go? Where were you sent for basic training? Basic training, we took the train from Boston down to South Carolina for Paris Island uh, basic training. And had you been out of state before? Was this a new adventure for you or? My family had gone on a vacation to Washington, D.C. Once, so that was my big venture out of state. We went to Niagara Falls, I think, once. These were all uh, travel by car trips. 
other than that, we'd go to the Cape or Nantasket. So the adventure of traveling wasn't uh, really part of my uh, lifestyle at the time. So going in by yourself mm -hmm. and taking the train to South Carolina, basically a foreign area to you, do you remember what you felt like? I suppose on the train going down, just kind of wide-eyed, with the, there were probably another 100 people that joined between South Station in Boston and Connecticut, New York. Uh, just saying, well, I hope I made the right decision. Uh, you know, I wonder what this is going to be like. Uh, my mother was very upset that uh, I had joined. I signed up in August and asked the recruiter if I could leave right after Labor Day because I enjoyed the Cape. I said, after Labor Day, the Cape shuts down, so I can go anytime here in September. And he said, no, he said, uh, we're all filled up in September. So I said, if I went into Boston, could I join? He said, uh, oh, no, no, they're all filled up. What it was, I'm sure he had his quota that he had to meet, and his September quota was met. So I he said, needed to right. fill the August quota. I said, how about October? He said, October, you can go anytime in October. I said, very good, October 1st. And he said, that's fine, we'll sign you up for October 1st. About a week later, I told my parents what I had done. Um, my mother was, like I said, very upset. Uh, she said, why wouldn't you have waited till after your birthday, which is October 5th? And it hadn't dawned on me that I was going in before or after my birthday. I said, well, so this way when I come out, I'll be a veteran and I still won't even be 21. So I, I went in and I remember celebrating my birthday down in Paris Island. I was there about two days. And so just, you did leave in October, not in... Right. Yeah, you signed up in August. I signed but, up okay. in August, uh, but they, they didn't have room for me until October 1st. What do you remember about liking or disliking the whole format of basic training and being in South Carolina? I, I think the whole idea was uh, I made a commitment. Here I am, so whatever they're going to do, they're going to do to me. And the idea of, it was fairly novel. The only thing I think that helped was um, I was on the football team in Natick. I wasn't a star, I was just on the team. But we went through all the spring training and uh, summer training practices. That was a little bit of physical discipline uh, that you had to stay with it. You committed yourself to something, you stayed with it. And I. That kind of helped, I believe, with uh, getting through the boot camp. That I, you know, we made this commitment, uh, or I made this commitment. Well, I was there with another hundred people. They all made the same commitment. None of us were draftees in the platoon that I was in. And, Do you think that yeah. made a difference? A bit. I think it did because we we had signed up. We had volunteered. Um, I know the drill instructor one time told us that he could do whatever he wanted to uh, with us that some men down at the end of the street, he said, see those men? He said, some of them got drafted. They never wanted to be in the Marine Corps. So I might feel sorry for them because they didn't want to be here to begin with. But all of you signed up. You wanted to be here so we can do whatever we want with you because you asked for this. And he was right. But um, you made it through. Yes. At that point in time, were you establishing any close relationships with other Marines? Not really. You don't. At least at that time, you don't establish a lot of uh, contacts, uh, closeness with uh, the other Marines because we couldn't really talk. Uh, you were allowed to speak on Sunday uh, to the people who were in your surrounding bunks. But basically, you did your work. You'd, you'd talk when you had something to say, like, come on, let's go, you're next, or something like that. But uh, there wasn't a lot of conversation that was allowed. So you got to know other Marines if the drill instructor signals somebody out and asks, what, what do you do, what, you know, where'd and, you come from? So that's long, how you learn about the other Marines. How long did de basic training last? I was on the accelerated program. We, had, we were there for eight weeks. Before that, it was, a, I believe, a 12-week program. And why was it accelerated? Because of the Tet? Because of Tet. They wanted to replenish the uh, troops in Vietnam, so they... Uh, and did they ever say to you, replenish because A, they've gone home, or B, they've been injured or killed? Did you? They, they never said. Did 
Did you assume all of that? At the time, I wasn't. I we I think considered ourselves lucky uh, that great we get to finish up boot camp in eight weeks instead of twelve weeks. That uh, it's a little little piece of hell, so we'll only have to stay here for eight weeks. And did you have any advanced or specialized training beyond basic? After basic training, I went to ITR, which is all Marines have to go through an infantry training. After that, I went to Naval Gunfire School to learn how to be a forward observer for Naval Gunfire. And did they explain to you what a forward observer was? No, it was, it, they did when I got there. It was kind of funny. The drill instructor, at the end of your time at boot camp, they'll assign you to different uh, professions that you're going to have in the military. About week six, the drill instructor would ask the graduating class, a member of the graduating platoon, to come down to our squad bay. And he would ask how many of the Marines that are graduating are going into the infantry. And it started out with 100%. Now these were Marines who had just finished basic training, so they weren't deceiving us at all. Uh, it sat out 100%. And each week I noticed it got a little bit less, 90%, 80%. When I graduated, I think it was about 60% of my platoon went infantry. The other 40 were assigned to different uh, jobs within the military. And what about when, you? When he came down, when he was calling off the names, he said, uh, Griffin, you're going to, and he looked, he said, naval gunfire. He said, you're going to be on a ship firing guns. And I thought, well, that's feeling nice, that'll be a, a nice voyage. When I got to Norfolk, Little Creek, Virginia. Was that after Paris Island? That was after Paris mm -hmm. Island. I reported in there after the infantry training. We split up and went to our various schools. Uh, when I reported to Little Creek, the first day of class, they said, you people are going to be the uh, forward observers for naval gunfire. I raised my hand and I said, excuse me, the drill instructor said that I'd be on board a ship firing these guns. He said. Absolutely not. He said, those drill instructors have no idea what they're talking about. But this is what you're going to be doing. So that's fine. Just accept what it is. And so you would on. be a Marine working with the Navy? I, was, I would tell the ships where to position themselves, and then I would tell them what target they were going to be uh, firing at. And once they fired, I would adjust the fire left or right, up and down, to make sure they hit the target. And when you were doing this, you were with a Marine group? I was with a Marine unit, yes. We supported the uh, Arvins, the South Vietnamese Army. My unit was Anglico. A-N-G-L-I-C-O? Right. And what did that stand for? Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. And we you... supported everybody except Marines. So we were always the oddball. Uh, every base that I went to it would be either myself or my partner, or uh, sometimes the small headquarters that we had, had would have four of us there, and the, we would be the Marines on the base. And you mentioned your partner. Yes. So you were hooked up with someone who had similar job as right, you? Right, right. Steve Fair. He had gone through the Naval Gunfire School with me. And Steve came from where? Brooklyn. New York. Brooklyn, New York. And so as as partners, as you said, you were supporting the South Vietnamese yes. Army and rarely the Marines. Your first duty station, when you were in Norfolk, how soon after did you know you were going overseas? I think the assumption was that when you finish up school, uh, we were in for two years, so pretty soon they're going to use you for naval gunfire. As it turned out, uh, not all of us went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, we, after Little Creek, Virginia, we went down to Camp Lejeune. I was stationed there for three months. And there was a commitment on, I would say probably about a dozen of us, that we had joined the Marines to go to Vietnam mm -hmm. and to fight in the war. So every Friday or every other Friday, we would go into the headquarters and ask for a transfer to uh, Vietnam. So you actually asked for it? Yes. And did they accept that? 
the first few weeks, uh, I think I was there a month and or maybe more, six weeks, uh, there was no transfers. And, and then one day they came down and they said, we had transfer orders for about 10 of us. And they said, you're going to Vietnam. I said, oh, did we make a mistake on kind of requesting this transfer? But we had made the commitment, so. And do you think they didn't allow you to go over right away because you were still learning when you no. were at Lejeune? No, I think it was just a matter of uh, when we need you, we'll call you. And when you. the paperwork was ready right. for you to go. Right. When I had trained on how to call a naval gunfire in Little Creek, there were naval officers and Marine enlisted went through the same class, same classes. We would take class A, the officers would take class B. Then halfway through the morning we'd have a coffee break and would switch. So we took the identical classes as the naval officers and that was a little bit of a joke that Marine enlisted are equivalent to naval officers. Were they newly graduated naval officers? Yes, yes. So they were pretty green. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the, there was a terrain map, uh, like a paper mache, uh, those volcanoes the kids make in school, but a, a massive, probably eight by eight terrain map of hills and dales and places where there would be water and places where the ships would be with a little light above it that when you called in the naval gunfire, this little light would come on a string and it would have a red flash down to where you called in naval gunfire. Did you have the right target? Were you able to read a map correctly? Which is nice, it was cute. Um, when we graduated from school, they said, now you people will be going to Camp Lejeune as part of Second Anglico, then you'll be going to Viegas off the coast of Puerto Rico, and you'll be calling in naval gunfire there as practice. I said, oh, that's nice to avoid the little red light. The first time I ever saw naval gunfire fired was I was calling it in over in Vietnam. We never went to Viegas. You didn't so I never it. saw it. I never got to practice with a real ship uh, until I got to Vietnam. And when did you, when were you sent over to Nam? Do you remember? When I went, we came home on leave for a month in May of 1969 went out to California to Camp Pendleton to prepare for jungle training. The first day I was there, you go through various stations, various tables with a person at each table that will check off your travel expenses and whatever else they had to check off. One of the tables, they said, you're going to be going to language school in Monterey, California. Now, I met my compadres from school that we had all gone on leave together, we had all volunteered together. I knew that they were there and they were all going to Vietnam. I said, I'm not going to language school, I'm going to Vietnam with my friends. And they said, <laughs> the corporal who was in charge of that desk said, no, you're going to language school. And I tried to explain to them that at Natick High School I was no good in languages. I took Latin and French and snunk at both of them and at Framingham State I took French again. Was this the first time language school had been brought up? Yes. It was something I had never dreamed of. Um, finally, the guy said, when you were in boot camp, you took an aptitude test that says you qualify for language schools. They need people in the language school. You're going, and there is no discussion. You're just going, move to the next station. I finished up with the various stations, came out of the building that my friends were over on the side of the road. So I came over, dejected that. I'll be going to Vietnam after you guys. He said, hey, we're going to language school up in Monterey, California. I said, my God, we're staying together. So a bunch of us went to language school in Monterey for three months. And did you learn any language? Yes, yes. It was uh, 12 weeks at the Defense Language Institute of Monterey. They do the training there for people who work in embassies. I imagine some of the CIA people uh, also go through there. It's an extensive language school. For us, it was 12 weeks. Some people are there for over a year. Uh, it's nine to four language all the time. And were you learning Vietnamese? Yes, yes. For interrogation purposes, did you think? No, I believe what they wanted to do was they were having some problems with military people and the Vietnamese population. Uh, I think it was a, a matter of respect and um, I don't know if the Marines were 
singled out, but they figured if uh, we could learn the language, maybe we could talk and communicate with the Vietnamese nationals so that relations would be a little bit better with the uh, South Vietnamese. So you finished up language school with your buddies? Yes. 12 weeks, and yeah. then did you go to Vietnam? Then I went to Vietnam. So that must have been then late summer? Yes, of uh, 1969. And now, it was funny because we went through the jungle training in Camp Pendleton first. So we went all through the jungle train. It lasted two weeks. But all through jungle train, everything that the instructors would say is, you better pay attention because if you don't pay attention now, next week you're going to be in Vietnam and you'll get yourself killed and a lot of other people. And then a group of us would raise their hand and say, no, we're going to Monterey, California. They don't kill people at the language school. So we don't really have to pay attention to you that much because we're going to language school. And we upset the whole program and the NCOs who were in charge. Uh, it became a joke uh, among, I think we were with probably 120 people and the 30 of us were going to this language school. Um, and then they hated us uh, through the jungle train. Because you had a sense of humor. Yes, yes. So 30 of you were a pretty tight-knit group. Yes, yes. And were you all going to different areas of Vietnam? Yes, yes. And is that when you set up a partnership with Mr. Fair? Uh, yes, it, probably, yes. Uh, we got to know each other. Well, I knew him through language school, uh, through uh, Naval Gunfire School, uh, Camp Lejeune. We went through the jungle train, then we went to uh, language school. Then we went to Vietnam together. There was a number of us that went to Vietnam. We were with the uh, Marines up in Dong Ha, 312, when we first got to Vietnam. And how do you spell that? Dong Ha, mm -hmm. D-O-N-G-H-A. And was it northern Vietnam? Yes, it was on the DMZ. How did you get over there? Did you fly? Flew Continental Airlines. A regular airline? Yes. Continental would take us from Travis Air Force Base in California, Norton Air Force Base in California to Okinawa. We stayed in Okinawa for three days and waited till our name was called to go to Vietnam, which was kind of funny also because when we got there, there's a transit barracks that we were assigned to just for people who aren't going to be there too long. Here's your bunk, stay here, wake up in the morning, get in a formation. If they call your name, you'll get on the plane and go to Vietnam. If not, sit in the barracks, wait for a noontime formation. If they call your name, you go to Vietnam. If not, you sit in the barracks and you wait. And late afternoon, we'll have another formation. There was a swimming pool probably three blocks away, an enormous swimming pool. And I said to somebody there, I found out there was a swimming pool, I said, why don't we go to the swimming pool while we're waiting for these formations? Absolutely not, you can't go to the swimming pool. <laughs> why not? We're not doing anything. No, you can't go to the swimming pool. So, all right. Went to the afternoon formation, about five of us. So let's go down to the swimming pool. Stole some bathing suits in the PX there. Went into the changing room, changed into the things. Went in the swimming pool, stayed in the pool until a half an hour before the formation, came out. Got dressed. Because I figured, I said, what are they going to do? Is that they're going to bust us and send us to Vietnam. That's the worst that can happen to us. So we might as well enjoy a couple of days in the pool. And it was funny, when I was there, I saw a guy that I had graduated from high school with. Uh, now this is significant. Uh, Joe Gennetti. His plane landed uh, in Okinawa to refuel before they went to Hawaii or on to California, or wherever the flight was going for him. And I saw him off in the distance. I said, my gosh, that kind of looks like a kid I went to high school with. So I followed him up a path and saw Joe, and it was Joe. Uh, again, I didn't know that he had joined the Marines. He didn't know that I had joined. So I said, what are you doing? He said, uh, my plane's refueling. I just came back from that you know, hours ago. So uh, I said, what are you doing now? He said, I'm going to the PX. He said, I'm going to pick up some stuff. So I went with him, and he was getting some ribbons, some medals. I said, you don't have a purple hat? He said, no. 
I said, they're telling us everybody's getting hit over there, that uh, everybody's going to get a purple hat because we're all going to get shot or hit or whatever. And he said, no. He said, don't listen to that. He said, just duck. He said, be a good native guy and duck and you won't get a purple hat. <laughs> he said, one thing you will have a problem with are the jungle boots. He said, because the Marines are pulling out of Vietnam and you're going over, he said, the supplies haven't been going to Vietnam. You won't have jungle boots when you get over there and you're going to need them. He said, these guys are throwing away their jungle boots now in the trash. He said, you ought to pick some up. He said, just to have them. I said, oh, all right. So I went back to the group of guys that I was with, and I told them, explained to them what my neighborhood buddy had said. So some of them went and got the boots, some didn't. And what was the difference? The jungle boots were leather with the green canvas that wouldn't rot uh, in the Heat. water and the heat. Mm -hmm. The black boots that we had uh, would rot. When we got to Vietnam, they didn't have the supplies for us. So I had boots, the other guys didn't have the black boots, and some of them, uh, they did get rotten when they were over there. Mm -hmm. They had to wait for supplies. So again, you listen to somebody from Natick and you, you benefit. You benefited from it. Right. So you arrive in Dong Ha. What was the first thing you remember about the heat the weather, the, the landscape. Tell us about that. It was, I, I think there's a, a great deal of fear or anticipation of what's going to happen when you're going into uh, a combat country uh, with all the stories the, uh, that we had heard. And there was like a, a gallows humor, I remember, on the plane ride going over. And one of the guys said, you people are all laughing and joking. But this is really serious. I said, calm down. I said, everybody knows it's serious. We all know where we're going. And this is just a way to get over it. When we landed in Da Nang, again, they weren't prepared for us. We, there's a big hangar that we checked into. And the sergeant or staff sergeant, whatever, in charge of checking in the new troops, said, who are you guys and why are you here? If you're going to have a problem with this, he said, I came from, to Vietnam for three things. To see somebody in one of those little hats, to see a water buffalo, and to see Bob Hope. He said, there's the hat, there's the water buffalo, and there's the plane. We can go home right now if we're going to have a problem with this. So I can catch Bob Hope back in Boston. And he said, oh, wait a minute. He said, you guys are supposed to be here three months ago. <laughs> we got called for language school. He said, who told you to go to language school? I said, some guy sitting at a desk in Camp Pendleton. So they weren't prepared for us. But uh, I said, does that mean we leave? He said, no. He said, we'll find a place for you. About half a dozen of us were assigned to Dong Ha. And on the plane from Da Nang up to Dong Ha, of course, we didn't know what Dong Ha is or was or where it was, I asked what looked like an old salty marine whose uniform was all dirty and he was waiting at the airstrip. He said, have you ever heard of Dong Ha? He said, oh yeah, he said, Rocket City. I said, ah, oh. he said, no, I don't want to ask. He said, but why do you call it Rocket City? He said, because you're always getting rocketed. He said, that's what I thought. So I went back and told the guy, I said, hey, we're going to some place called Rocket City. The plane landed, it's an old cargo plane that was going to take us up. I said, okay, you guys get on the cargo plane. Now we're still in our stateside green utilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Plane lands. The Air Force guy said, okay, everybody get off. I said, okay, we get off the plane. I said, is this Dong Hai? He said, no. I said, maybe you misunderstood. We're going to Dong Hai. He said, you told us to get on this plane. He said, you said you were going to Dong Hai. He said, we don't fly into Dong Hai. It gets hit all the time. He said, where are we? He said, Quang Tree. I said, where's Dong Ha? He said, we just got here like four hours ago. I said, I have no idea. I said, why don't we just go back on the plane? When you guys get your act together and can take us to Dong Ha, then we'll go up to Dong Ha. He said, no, no, no. He said, you get off here and you can uh, work your way over to Dong Ha. I said, how do you do that? He said, thumb. So we got off the plane. We're at the airstrip. Started going down the road. Finally, a CB in a big dump truck picked us up. So where are you going? He said, we're going to Dong Ha. He said, oh, it's all right, hop in. So we threw all our sea bags up in the back of the dump truck. He went down the road for 
a period of time, you know, 10 minutes, half an hour, I don't even remember how long it was. But then he stopped in the, in the middle of nowhere. But and it's, he said, is it flat land? Is it it's jungle? It's flat. It's flat. Hot? The, the, yes. And there's some mountains off in the distance, but he said, I have to go left down this road. You guys just keep going straight. Get your stuff out of the truck. So there's a half dozen of us standing in the middle of, there's no, nothing there. There's a road that goes to the left and one that goes straight. And one of the guys said, well, why don't we start walking? I said, no. I said, I didn't walk when I was in California at language school. We thumbed all over the place. So I'm not walking anyway. So we got one ride, we'll get another ride. We're there about 10 minutes and then MP pulls up. And he said, what are you guys doing? And we explained to him that CB picked us up in the truck. He said he had to go left. He told us to just keep going straight. He says, that right? He, said, he called in his radio. He said, straight's the DMZ. He said, you would have walked into North Vietnam. He said, that isn't funny and it's not right. He called down to, it, Dong Ha was to the left. Whatever happened to that CB, I don't know. I, I hope he got severely punished because uh, that wasn't funny our first day. So that was our first greeting to welcome to Vietnam. So then did the MP take you? Yes. He, he called up for a truck to come out and pick us up and uh, took us into Dong Ha. So once you got in there, it was a camp that was set up. Yes. And how was it set up? Were there tents or huts or? Tents. Uh -huh. And was it a large camp? Uh, fairly large, yes. How many people do you I think? I would guess around uh, 200. And was this area just Marines or were the um, South Vietnamese there also? Just Marines. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Dong Ha? Three weeks. And what happened on a daily basis there? What did you do? Um, well, and this would be a little point of history, I think, that kind of gets overlooked um, because it's not nice. In 19, well, in October of 69, there was a great racial divide within the military uh, over in Vietnam. Uh, there were, well, I wouldn't say atrocities, but um, racial conflicts uh, throughout, at least throughout the Marines. I'm sure that the Army was faced with it also. With other soldiers, you mean? Right, uh other Marines. The first people to uh, shoot at me were black Marines. As I understand now in historical perspective, um, I've talked to various people about this. They said after Martin Luther King was assassinated, there was a great resentment uh, within the black community towards the white establishment, towards being um, in Vietnam, fighting for the establishment, which had, in their perspective, had, had killed their leader. Uh, so there, there was a great uh, animosity between uh, the races. So I was in a tent with seven or eight other Marines. Were they? Were you segregated at that time? The tent that I was in was all white, mm -hmm. um, only because they said there's a couple of uh, bunks here for cots for you guys. Uh, so we stayed there, and I remember it was at night we got uh, shot at. Uh, a shot into it, a shot at the tent. Um, and it was like, well, grab your rifle and helmet and stop playing Marine now. Guy said, just lay still. He said, I think those are the blacks shooting at us. I said, why? He said, because they know that it's just white guys in the tent. And that's when it hit me. I said, my God, you know, who are we fighting here? I said, I said, we should be fighting the VC or the NVA. Um, I, I didn't know that things were that bad at that time, but they weren't. They said, don't ever go out at night walking throughout the base unless there's two or three of you uh, because of that, that point. So it was, that was kind of a sad part of our history that I don't think is always brought out. Uh, but I did see it throughout Vietnam when I went down. And so, you, were witness, you were part of it. Right. So, How was it during the day when you were, were you ever with them like in mess hall or whatever you would call it or how were you treating how were each of you treating each other knowing that you were shot at the night before there was uh, everything was segregated when you went into the there was a mess tent um, the blacks had a handshake that would go on for 30 seconds sometimes 
uh, became exaggerated with them. Uh, but I think it was to show their brotherhood. But they would sit at the table with blacks, the white guys would sit with the table of white guys. Uh, and very rarely would the twain meet. And I've spoken to guys that were in Vietnam in 67, 68. They said, did you ever see, uh, did you have a lot of trouble with black guys? And they said, no, not, not really. It would be, there might have been a problem or something that, that would just happen in life. Uh, I said, no, I said, this was a sharp uh, you know, class distinction that uh, was major. Sad. Very sad. Yes. Yeah. Um, once you got established, you said you were in Dong Ha for three weeks. Right. Then what happened? Um, well, when I was in Dong Ha, they had us, I, I would control the um, radio communications for artillery. The spotters would call into the command center and say, we need to have artillery fired at this section or this target, and I would take their message, clear it to make sure that they weren't friendlies that they were firing upon. Then we would tell the artillery that was right with us to fire the rounds. Uh, a funny story, we got, I was up in a tall tower, probably like the third or fourth night in Vietnam. It was up on top of telephone posts, more or less. You climb up, and I went up with my friend Fair, he said, you two were assigned to post one, and you would rotate sleep. You'd be on for two hours, then you'd wake up the next guy. I think there were three of us up in the tower. When we went up, my buddy said, I never told anybody this, but he said, I sleepwalk at night. And we were like 20 feet up in the air. So I said, ah. Oh. He said, so he said, if I get up during the night, he said, I'll probably talk to you, but I'm really sleepwalking. He said, just make sure I don't walk off the side. And I said, okay. So sure enough, he got up when I was on watch. I said, oh no, Steve, I know. He said, no, no, I really, I know I told you I sleepwalk, but I really am awake. He said, I'm kind of nervous up here. What's going to happen? I said, no, don't try to pull that with me. Said, Back and forth, finally I established that he really was awake. We got hit that night and a round came in, or a couple of rounds, whatever it was. And they called up to post one. Did you uh, see that round? And I said, yes. And I said, it hit right over here. He said, we know where it hit, Stu, but we're trying to figure out where it came from. He said, oh, no, I didn't see that. But then it kind of dawned on me, like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm really supposed to be trying to figure out here, where it's coming from. So Did you feel a like a sitting duck, though, if you were up in this tower? <laughs> Not really like a sitting like, I think we always had, or at least, I always had a confidence that when something happens, we'll be able to take care of it. So, but my first question, I, I blew the test question of, do you know where it came from? Is no. But that was the first. Right. That didn't happen again. No, no. That was I was young and inexperienced. After that, I learned how to take care of myself. So when you're observing. Mm -hmm. Was it always in a tower, or sometimes was it in the front Oh, that was line? just that one day that up in the tower. The that, uh, there were posts uh, all around the perimeter, and uh, the post one happened to be up in a tower. The other posts were out uh, on the ground. Uh, just I'm sure. I guess we had the best. They wanted somebody to have a good perspective. Unfortunately, they had a good perspective with somebody who didn't know what he was looking for at the time. And, so then did you have to go into the jungle itself at some point? Down south, when I went down south. Okay, so you, you were in Dong Ha for three weeks. Right. Did you go south then, or did you go... When we were in Dong Ha, they were pulling How? The I'm sorry, let me just interrupt a minute. How far was Dong Ha from the DMZ? I'm going to guess, like, maybe a mile. Okay. So... Go on, what you were saying. When we were there, they were starting to pull the Marines out. Uh, President Nixon, I believe it was, um, was pulling the Marines back to Okinawa. It was the, the downscaling of uh, Vietnam. They said they may be looking for, some of us may have to stay in Vietnam. They said it, most likely it's going to be you new guys that just came in the 
older guy said, you know, we've done our time. You just go, so that's fine, we'll play the game. So they said, if any of you want to volunteer to stay, you can. My buddy Fair from New York uh, said, we should stay. I said, yeah, all right. He said, uh, I was laying down on a cot and he came in at night and said, uh, well, the little Jewish kid from Brooklyn signed the paper to actually stay. He said, you guys from Boston just seem to talk about things an awful lot. So I said, well, yeah. He said, oh, no. He said, they had the, oh, he said, you know the paper was over there if you wanted to volunteer to stay. He said, I signed it, but uh, I didn't happen to see your names on there. So uh, I said, all right, I'll go. So this John Champion from Swampscott said, when you go over, sign my name too. So the three of us will stay. So that's fine. So I went over, signed my name, signed Champion's name. Came back, said, OK, Champ, we're all set. We get to stay in Vietnam with Fair. He said, very good. He said, now, if anything should happen to me, this is going to be on your conscience for the rest of your life, because I never signed that paper. You put my name down there, so you're making me stay in Vietnam. <laughs> I said, thanks. So you signed to stay on. Right. Then they said, uh, what we're going to do is transfer you now to Anglico, where we belonged to begin with, because that really was what we were trained for. We went down to Saigon, and they told us at the time, they said, when you get to Saigon, it's a totally different world. When we got to Saigon, the first thing they, first we said we were from up north, which was a little bit of credence with the people in Saigon, because at the time, Saigon didn't really see that much action. And they knew that where we were from, we'd uh, seen a little bit of action. They said, well, how would you like supplies? I said, what do you mean? Said, oh, you don't have supplies. We'll take you out to the supply building. And so I give you all the boots you want. They gave us a watch, new utilities. I said, my god, this is a whole different world than where we came from. And wasn't Saigon more of a city then, City, too? yes, it was. Mm -hmm. You could uh, travel around Saigon, uh, which we did for the couple of days that we were there. They had uh, bars and hotels, and we visited all, the, or as many as we could. Uh, you'd travel with the little Cyclos. It was a motor scooter with the carriage in the back, um, or a taxi, the little taxis. They were funny. They'd drive their taxis up on the sidewalk if they wanted to avoid traffic. <laughs> was it very congested with people? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So you were there for a few days and then? About three days. Uh, three days of r and We just enjoyed it uh, immensely. Then we, uh, the headquarters asked, somebody in the headquarters asked us, any of you guys want to stay together? Well, Champ and I had been together. We came home and I leave together from uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, Swampscott and Natick. So I said, well, Champ and I have really been together. I said, oh, that's very good, okay. Champ went back up to i -Corps. I was put down in the Delta. I said, ah. I said, could you separate us any further? If you did, we'd have to be in another country. Uh, so, uh, and that's when I hooked up with Steve Fair, which uh, it wasn't bad at all. It was kind of bad that I made it look like I didn't want him at all. But uh, they said, you can only go in pairs. And where was the Delta as compared to um, Dong Ha and Saigon. Exact opposite end of the country. Dong Ha was the furthest north, the Delta was the furthest south. And what was happening down there? There I worked with the 21st Arban Division. Uh, the train was very flat. It's a Delta. Uh, the silt from the Mekong River makes up the, uh, the topography of uh, that part of Vietnam. There's the flat land, and there was also a forest, the Yumin Forest, that the, I guess the French had lost a whole division, uh, that they never found them, I mean, lost, lost, uh, in the Yumin Forest. That so was kind of like a no man's land for everybody. And what was happening down there? The, were the, uh, were the Arvin, RVN, is that what, which yeah. was the South Vietnamese, right. were they, um, did they welcome you to be with them? Yes, because we were helping them out. Uh, we were in support of the, uh, the Arvins. <coughs> the main people who were fighting with the VC. 
Up north, you'd have the NBA, uh, which was a, a regular army that they were fighting the, N, uh, the NBA up north. And north, and that would have been North Vietnamese right. army. And then when you say the VC, would the that VC have been South Vietnamese who were communists? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the people in the black pajamas mm -hmm. that were uh, looking for a change in the, the government, that they supported the uh, communist regime. But they were not, they were an organized popular force. They weren't a regular army, though. They didn't have the, they had the weaponry, but not the uniforms of the NBA. And did you come in close contact with them? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, I began with uh, flying missions. I would go up in a bird dog, which is a two-seater plane. The pilot sits in the front seat, and I would sit directly in back from him. We would fly over an area looking for any type of enemy action or any sort of enemy um, structures. Once we saw them, they were targeted. I would call the ship and tell them where they were, and then the ship would fire on the, uh, the target. Now, before I did that, I would uh, have to go to the headquarters to make sure that the whole area was cleared off. It would be like if I said, we're going to blow up half of Natick. Uh, it would have to be cleared to make sure that the artillery wasn't there, there were no friend friendly troops there, the Air Force wasn't running an airstrike, and uh, I would make sure that I checked with everybody to make sure my area was cleared so that whoever was there was the enemy and no one else was going to be firing uh, at the same time as I was. Because it would be a problem with, uh, and I had a problem with, uh, if an airstrike came in, and I was flying in my little bird dog. The, I had a jet veer off right in front of us. He called off his mission. Uh, the pilot was upset. Uh, I was upset. Uh, the pilot, because he was flying, he was my taxi, but because I was enlisted and he was an officer, he thought that I had made a mistake and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I hollered at him, he hollered at me, and I said, when we get back, we'll straighten this out. As it turned out, the Air Force said, oh, we knew naval gunfire was being fired, but we figured we could also hit the area very hard. I said, I said once it says naval gunfire, those are the only people who are to be firing. There's a reason for everything. So the officers of the Air Force had made a mistake. But it would have killed the pilot in the jet who was calling in the mission. He, he was really upset with us uh, because they don't like little planes to begin with to be anywhere around there superstructures. Uh, but I can see his point. He was he was 100 percent right. Some fool on the ground had made a mistake. But did he also admit after the fact that it wasn't your mistake? I, I made the uh, Air Force uh, Aware. person tell the Army uh, pilot that uh, it wasn't my mistake, it was their mistake. Because I was very, very big on clearing. That was the one thing that I was good about. Uh, I wanted to make sure that everything was cleared uh, the way it should be. So you're in a little two-seater. Yes. Were you shot at? Yes. At, well, tell us. Th that would just be a little, uh, we got shot, our wings got shot up one time. Uh, and the plane landed, there wasn't a problem. My buddy Fair was in another plane at the time. Um, he landed about the same time. And my pilot said, wait till they come over here and we'll tell them about our plane. And the pilot and Steve came over to Chris. Ah, how was your mission today? The guy said, we got shot at. He said, oh, and kind of a little level of uh, bringing the accolades that he thought he was going to be getting down. He said, where did you get shot? And they got shot right in the propeller. So if the propeller blade had been one shot off, it was going right at the pilot's head. Uh, so it was just by fate of God that he didn't get hurt. So what about you? Uh, oh, we got shot too, and our wings got shot. <laughs> it was no big deal. So. But was it when that was happening? I mean, you're a young kid. I, I, for some reason, I had a feeling probably the second month that I was there that I was going to come home from Vietnam, that uh, nothing was going to happen to me. And I went in with that um, protective shield around me that no matter what you do, I'm coming home, nothing's going to happen to me. And it worked. 
Did you also have to go um, on, on foot to call in? Yes. And, and what was that? Was that through the jungle? Is that when you used your jungle experience? or? Yes. Um, I went with the uh, 21st Avenue Division. It'd be, we had one American, uh, myself, there might have been two American, uh, there'd be American officers, American Army officers, and myself, and the rest would be Vietnamese. And we would go out on patrol uh, throughout uh, the jungle. Would that be daytime or night? Uh, daytime. Talk about like one day that you can think of doing that. Tell us about all of it. I, mean, well, I know that's it was hard a, to ask. But. A funny, we went out, the first time I went out, uh, the Army people said, uh, one of the Army captains said, do you want to come out with us to call on the naval gunfire from the ground? I said, sure. So I got my stuff ready and we went out. And before we went out, I said, where's your rifle? He said, oh, he said, I have the uh, Vietnamese to protect me. I said, as a Marine, I'd like to also have my rifle. So I'm going to take my rifle along with me. I said, uh, these people are nice, but I'd like to be able to also help myself out. We were out about a half an hour and we got hit. They started shooting. And he was probably 10 feet in front of me. And now he's all scrunched down, like all the rest of us trying not to get hit. <laughs> and where's your rifle now there, big guy? We managed to go along well. Uh, he didn't get hit, I didn't get hit. We had to go through a uh, swamp as from one point to the other. And we're walking through the swamp, and it was not real deep, but it was like waist deep. And finally got out to the other side of the, uh, on land. Now it's around lunchtime, so we're gonna take a little break. And the Vietnamese came over with uh, a bag, and they were always picking up chickens. Somehow, wherever we went, they'd find chickens. Live uh, chickens. Live chickens. So they come over, and. They want to show the Americans. And so he's got a burlap sack. Ah, number one, number one. I said, that's good. I said, ah, you want to see? I said, what do I want to see a stupid chicken for? No. So go away. No, 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 number one, number one. So, all right, let's see. It's a big, long snake. It's about a 10 foot long snake. And I have a fear of snakes. I fear snakes and trampolines for whatever reason. I just don't like them. So now he's, I said, oh, I said, get that thing away from me. Well, the captain now wants his picture taken to send back home to all the folks with the stupid snake around his neck. So he doesn't care. I said, good. I said, I'll take your picture. So I take his picture. He's happy. He said, yeah, and I said, absolutely not. I said, I don't like snakes. I don't want the thing around my neck. So you have the picture. You're happy. So tell them to eat the snake or whatever the hell they're going to do with the snake. That's fine. We walk out a little bit more. Now we have to come back to base. Well, to get back to our little campsite that we were at to begin with, we had to walk through that water again. So the whole way I was just walking with my rifle pointed down, never looking up around me, just waiting for a snake, snake. to come by. If a snake had come by, I probably would have shot my leg. But um, I, I, we made it up. I didn't get shot. There were no snakes. There probably were. I never saw them. Uh, so I was very, I hate snakes. At that time, were you able to use the language that you had gone to school for? A little bit, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And what, what was your rank at that point? I was an E3. How long were you in the Delta? I was there 10 months. That's a long time. I, I, I moved around. Unfortunately, um, one of the bad sides, I suppose, of my job was that we were always traveling. Because I talked to guys now, especially Marines, who we were with, oh, I was with 312, and they can tell you everybody who they were with because they were with them for a year. Steve and I traveled all around the Delta, wherever they needed naval gunfire. So we moved from base to base. I don't think I was ever at one base more than uh, maybe four weeks. Uh, it's okay, now we have to move to the other side of the Delta because that's where the ships were going to be for the naval gunfire support. 
So we'd move around. So I get to know people, but at first people are a little bit leery of, you know, who's the new guy? Um, we were in oddity because there were always army, there was an army base and we'd be the Marines on the base. And why are you guys here? Uh, what do you do? Um, and after we got through explaining things and getting to know people a little bit, it's okay. We need you on the other side, so we'd pack up and move to the other side. So. So your relationship with Steve must have been pretty close. Yes, yes. Being that you were always together with different groups. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the officers that you were working with were um, good in their leadership qualities? Yes, yes. The, uh, the Army officers who I worked with were, uh, they were very good in, in that they also respected where we were coming from, Steve and I, because we were enlisted, but we controlled the naval gunfire. You were so specialized, I'm right. sure, right? So mm -hmm. we would sit down with the artillery officer, the Air Force officer, and we represented the naval gunfire. But we had to be treated as equals because we were in charge of our various fields. One base I was in Kamau, uh, I was billeted in the officer's billet. And of course, a lot of the Army guys said, why are you two assigned to the officers part of the base? I said, because we're Marines. I said, obviously, a Marine enlisted would be the same as an Army officer. So we were there, and it, it was fun for us. Did you have to receive any type of medical care while you were there? No, I had pneumonia. Uh, when I sw switched from up north to down south, because it was, we were in the monsoons up north, um, we were just wet all the time. Uh, when I went down south, it was dry, and for some reason I got uh, pneumonia. And talk about the monsoons. I don't know if people realize we have heavy rain here, but what's the difference? Well, one of the problems with the monsoon was it's a torrential rain that would last for forever. Um, but where we were, especially the new guys. We came in, we had two sets of uniforms. Well, if on Monday it rained all day and you're walking around the mud, you got that uniform wet. Then Tuesday you can put that other uniform on that you had, but there wasn't a washer or dryer around. So on Wednesday, just go back and put on one of your two wet uniforms uh, because you can't dry your clothes. So no matter how you look at it, you're gonna be wet. So uh, when the monsoons came, Guys were just wet all the time. You were wet and grumpy all the time. But, uh, that, that was your that was the way it wet was. life, yes. But it wasn't bad because it wasn't that you were the only one suffering through this. You had another 100, 200, 500 guys that were all in the same boat with you. When you talked earlier about friendly fire, mm -hmm. uh, and we know there were incidences of being injured by friendly fire, were you a part of any of that, or did you hear about cases like that that yes. affected? Tell us about that. There was one time when I was out on one of my ships, one of the destroyers, to brief the ship as to what they were going to be doing for the next two or three weeks. I forget how I got out to the ship to begin with. I might have gone out on a little sand pan or something with a Vietnamese. I think a Vietnamese had taken us out. Um, when I was through with the briefing, I got to stay over night on the ship, which is nice. The next day they were trying to uh, communicate with uh, the land to have somebody come and pick me up. Well, as it turned out, there was a SEAL team who I had worked with and stationed with, who I knew they were on the same base as I was. And there was a, a good rivalry between the, I was part of the Navy, according to them, so that I could have a beer with them and, nothing to do with the Army. But there were, the SEALs are an excellent, excellent team. They're, they really are all that they're cracked up to be. They got the message to come out and pick up a package from the ship. But we have somebody that has to be transported. So the SEAL team comes out in two sandpans, and as they're coming out, I recognize who they are. So I start waving, saying, hi, taxi, taxi. And as they got closer, they looked up, I said, why? I said, I'm your very special package. <laughs> You're my taxi. 
then <laughs> they had a lot of comments from the little stupid sandpans. They put the net over the side and I climbed down and got in the sandpan. Now we're coming back into the land and then we're going to go through the uh, river system to get back to base. But we were on land from the coast in maybe five minutes. And all of a sudden I noticed there was this airstrike that he made four or five passes just laying in the bombs. And it was like a little air show. So the seals stopped the two boats and we took a minute or so and just was, wow, so they really have somebody over there. And they were far enough away from us that, but not all that far that as we're going up the sand pants now where they're bombing here, they're gonna run like little ants. They're gonna possibly come over to our area. So you become hyper aware of your surroundings. Got back to the base. The next day or two days later, I got called into the Army uh, Fulbright Colonel's office. They said, come up, he wants to see you about some naval gunfire. I said, okay. Was that uncommon or common for you to Uncommon, because okay. I was kind of left on my own. That mm -hmm. There was a good respect between the Colonel, Colonel Jones uh, and myself. That I knew what I was doing, I was good at what I was doing, and he respected that. He called me in, he said, uh, we have a problem with, there were, it was an odd number, like 111, 113 uh, Vietnamese uh, popular forces were killed two days ago. He said, we're pretty sure it'd be naval gunfire. He said, it couldn't have been. He said, well, he said, unfortunately, he said, uh, we think it's naval gunfire. He said, you're going to stop right there. I said, you had a guy named Callie on Time Magazine. I, said, I remember seeing his picture on Time Magazine with killing civilians. When you were over there, you right. saw that. So, so said, it did make the news over there. So I said, there. we're not going to stop playing this now. He said, if you check the log, he said, whenever a ship fires, it's all logged in. He said, I'm the one who calls in all the naval gunfire. He said, I was on board the ship. He said, two days ago, that ship didn't fire because I was still on board. I wasn't directing any naval gunfire. And it hit me as to what had happened. I said, I know what happened. I said, it wasn't naval gunfire. I said, I know it was close to shore. I said, you can check the log of the ship. I said, the ship never fired. So it wasn't naval gunfire. So it was the airstrike. airstrike. Now, I have no idea if it was the South Vietnamese, because they were jets, or our jets. Uh, but it was somebody in one of those planes. That, uh, and again, what had happened, because I found out later on that the POP forces were popular forces. It was like the reserves for the army here. You had the Arvin, the 21st Arvin Division. They would do their military thing. Then you had these reserves that liked to be part of the army too, but they really, they were part of the army, but they weren't. They were like make-believe soldiers. Well, one of their leaders decided, well, I'm going to go out and take my men over to this area. But he never told anybody. And obviously this jet saw, wow, I have a whole bunch of the enemy right here, went after them uh, and killed them. So it was too bad. So it was a mistake. Miscommunication. On, right. Clearance was always, always uh, very, very big with me. And that, that was why. That was one good, strong example as to why you have to clear with everybody. While you were over, I know you had the few days in Saigon on R&R. &R. Did you, ha were you able to get away for any other additional R&R? &R? Yes, I went to um, Hong Kong. What was that like? Oh, it's funny. It was, uh, again, a whole new uh, area of the world. And I got to see the people I'm going to live on boats in part of Hong Kong. And they say that they never really traveled outside of those boats. You'd hop from one boat to another boat to buy your groceries and another one to buy your clothes, but you basically stayed uh, on the, uh, the boats. We t I took a tour of the city, one of the bus tours that you take of Boston or whatever. I mean, one of the, the girls who was running the tour said, uh, and here on the right is the American Embassy. And as you can see, the eagle is the symbol for the American people. And in the Chinese culture, the eagle means a very big ego. And it was all Americans on American servicemen on the bus. 
Okay, I said, and he said, that very big ego is also paying your salary for this bus ride from the United States. Okay, so he said, you better knock it off with the American thing. But I took a train ride by myself just to travel along the train inside of Hong Kong. And a Chinese gentleman said, I think you want to get off at this stop. I said, well, I want to go to the end and turn around. He said, the next stop is the end where they'll turn the car around. But that is, he said, what you call communist China. He said, you may not have a problem, or they may give you a problem. He said, so he said, you should actually get off at this stop and wait for the train to come in. He said, thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I took his advice. I bought a boat there. I, my brother is nine years younger than I am. And he wrote a letter and said, if you're in Hong Kong, pick up some Hong Kong junk. Now, I was 20, so he was probably 11. Junk to an 11 year old means anything you can see it's Chinese. Junk to a 20 year old going to Hong Kong meant the Chinese the junk. Mm -hmm. Which so is the it. boat with the fan and the wood and I mean Sorry. the sail. Yes, mm -hmm. so was, I found a beautiful Chinese junk about this big. Wrapped it up to mail it back to uh, Sean. I came out of the hotel to you take a ferry across Hong Kong Harbor to where the airport, uh, the post office was. Take the Red Star Ferry. Well, I waited outside the hotel for a taxi. There was none. It was raining. I figured, here we go, monsoons up in Hong Kong. And I waited for a while. I said, well, I said, it looks like the, for one reason or another, cabs aren't running. So I kept walking up the street until I got to the Hong Kong, to the Red Star Ferry. When I got there, a big sign said, Red Star Ferry is shut down due to typhoon. So I had no idea that I was walking in the middle of a typhoon. So I had to wait till the next day to get over to the post office to mail the junk to, uh, to my brother. Now, when you were on R&R, &R, did you wear uniform or civilian clothes? No, we, they didn't want us to wear the uniform. When we left Saigon, the plane, we took the plane from Saigon, again, Continental Airlines, up to um, Hong Kong. They told us to change the uh, uniform, change out of uniform into civilian clothes before you get on the um, plane. Hong Kong didn't want people in military uniforms. When I flew up there, I flew up with some Australians. The Australians were told to keep their uniforms on when they were in the plane. So when we got to Hong Kong, there was a changing room. They said, now all you Australian troops, here's the changing room to change into your civilian clothes, change out of the uh, military uniform. So I don't know why the Aussies made them wait until they got to Hong Kong airport, but they did. So then you went back, and um, how much longer then did you have? I, you got to choose when you wanted to go on R&R, &R. Mm -hmm. and I chose to go uh, at the end of my tour, so I had three weeks left when I got back. And were they fairly easy three weeks, or...? Right. There were, there were, um, I was back in Kanto, which was the headquarters for the Mekong Delta. I would be receiving messages. I was then starting to train some of the new people who were coming to uh, into Anglico from the States, uh, preparing them for um, their, their time in Vietnam. So your friend from Natick uh, had initially given you a suggestion about getting the jungle boots. Right. What kind of suggestions did you give these newie, newbies coming in? Don't go into town by yourself mm -hmm. because you really don't know what you're doing. One of the kids, first night in Canto, decided it was the first afternoon that he's going to go into Canto for the night. He went in, came back around 10 o'clock at night, went outside the base and came back in. I said, I told you not to go into town by yourself. I said, I go into town all the time. So I know where I'm going and what to do is to stay with me. He said, well, he said, I can kind of take care of myself. He said, okay. I said, did any of the kids come up and say hi to you when you were walking around town? He said, yeah. He said, any of them take your wallet? He said, no. I said, yeah, check your pants. Wallet was gone. What the kids used to do is have a razor in their uh, hand, and they'd slice the pockets. I said, go look at your uniform. All of your pockets have been sliced. I said, you were so slick you never even knew that those kids were robbing you. I said, that's why I said, don't go into town 
until you come with me. This is, this is a little lesson learned for you. Sure. While you were there, how did you get your news? I know you mentioned you knew about Cali and through Time Magazine, so somebody mm -hmm. must have been sent Time Magazine. Yes. But how else did you get your news? Uh, there was, well, my family had the record, the old Boston record uh, mailed to me. And there was also um, AFVN, Armed Forces Vietnam Radio. So we, we were talking about the news, that you got this news from your parents and from the mag, or news from Vietnam. Right. What about what you were hearing about what was happening at home and the turmoil at home? As, a, as someone who was in the thick of it, what was your feeling and your friends, your other friends' feelings about what was happening? Um, I felt that the people didn't understand what we were doing or what we were under being in Vietnam, specifically the Cambodian operation. When President Nixon escalated the war into Cambodia, I was all for that at the time because down at the Delta, what was happening is the uh, North Vietnamese and the VC were using Cambodia as their staging area. They would be able to pick up supplies, organize, uh, resupply themselves in Cambodia and then cross over the line into Vietnam and attack us. So the people in Cambodia were basically attacking us. Uh, at the base I was at, when he said that we want you to, or we want the troops to go into Cambodia to stop the, uh, the bases there, uh, there was, I know there was a great protest back home because the war was being escalated into another country. I, I can see that point now, but on my side, being there, it was like, but that's where they're coming from. It's like uh, little kids when they touch the uh, ghouls, you know, my ghouls, one, two, three, you can't, uh, you can't tag me. Uh, that's what they were using that as. So I was all for the Cambodian operation when it began. Do you feel that you were properly trained and equipped? I know you did mention the boots, but you got other boots. Were right. you properly trained and equipped for what you faced? Yes, I would have to say I was because I went on and was able to do the job very well. So the train that I had uh, allowed me to do the job very well. But do you also feel, I, I, I've noticed with you, not only a sense of humor, but some spunkiness, uh, 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 self-image seemed very positive. Don't you feel or do you feel that that also helped you? Yes, yes. I think that, that carried us over. I know one time they had, with the uh, insurgents coming in from Cambodia, we knew that they had dropped off supplies somewhere near where we were because we were getting hit uh, fairly regularly and fairly heavily. I flew over a uh, graveyard, and they said, somewhere around here are their supplies. Well, the Vietnamese used to bury their dead above ground to the mounds. And for some reason, it struck me. I said, I'm going to guess not all those mounds are graves. So I blew up the graveyard. And what happened was uh, that was where the cachet was. That, uh, when a round explodes, there'll be an explosion. But if you wait a second or two seconds, there's another massive explosion after that, they call it a secondary explosion. Uh, that's because you hit an ammo dump, and that's what I had hit. But the pilot, the officer who was flying me, said, initially, he said, that's a graveyard. He said, I just don't think that that's a real graveyard. He said, I think that's where they hide. No, he said, I'm not part of this at all. I said, well, you're just my taxi anyway. He said, the ship, and the ship was just gaining a target number. So they had no idea what was there or not there, so they wouldn't question it. Um, an officer did come out a couple of days later because I fired an awful lot of rounds on there. He didn't believe the number of rounds that I had fired, and uh, he had questioned me. Um, and when he flew over, he said, I saw all those secondary explosions. I said, why were you there to begin with? He said, well, you fired an awful lot of rounds. I said, and if I said I did it, and I did it, and I told you what the target was, so that was the end of it. I said, don't ever question me again. I was very resentful. But I had that confidence initially to say, this is what I think would be the target. 
And when you say, I find it interesting you're talking about I shot it, you felt you were part of that whole unit because mm -hmm. your direction made the ship shoot the appropriate target. Yes. Very interesting. Do you feel your weapons were equal to, better than, or inferior to what you have faced? Uh, at, least, at least equal to. And you had three weeks left over there, and then what happened? How did you get home, and where did you fly into? I flew into, uh, that's when I went up to Travis, I believe it's Travis, right out of, uh, or in San Francisco. I flew from Vietnam, from Saigon, up to, uh, or over to Hawaii, where we refueled, we didn't get off the plane, and then Hawaii to um, San Francisco. And how much time did you have left at that point? I was getting out. Were you excited about that? Yes, yes, I wanted to, you know, I had done my thing, uh, I had proved my point, and I was going home. At what rank did you leave? Corporal. And with what, d did you get any decorations or commendations? Um, combat action, uh, the Vietnamese campaign ribbons. The Vietnamese Unit Distinction Award or something. And what were your feelings about coming home? Um, that that was it. Now uh, I wanted to. The, the Marines were over. Uh, I spent six days on Treasure Island, which is the it's a naval base right beside Alcatraz, and, and uh, I got discharged from there. And I got home the end of August and began Framingham State the first week of September. So and did you plan that ahead of time? Yes. Or? So home August of 70. 70. When you came home, did you discuss with your family or friends what you had seen and done over there? Not too much, no. A little bit, but uh, not too much. So you, you had been at Framingham State for one year. one year, so did they accept that year? So did you go in as a sophomore? Yes. Well, actually, um, I left under less than honorable conditions when I left Framingham State. So I had to make up some of the classes that, I, what had happened was I didn't, I wouldn't take finals because I didn't want to be there. And my father insisted that I was going to be a college student. And I knew if I didn't pass the classes that that would end that discussion. I knew what I wanted to do. So were you a special freshman taking on? So I guess, right. We'll take them back in. I took extra classes to uh, make up for my uh, lack of testing the first year. So I graduated in uh, three years when I came back. So it actually was a four-year program. Was Total four State. years. Yes. Wh what was your major? History with a minor in education. And did you use that as yes. a teacher? Were you a teacher? Or yes. are you a teacher? I, I was. I retired from Boston as a teacher. You taught in Boston? Yes. In what grade? Uh, middle school, special ed. What was that like? Oh, it was fun. I, I liked the city life. I liked the kids. Uh, I'm a city teacher. Uh, city kids you can be very direct with. Uh, I, I don't think, as much as I would love to work at Natick High doing something, I would probably last two weeks because I would tell some kid to do what he's supposed to do and some parent be up complaining. Uh, too much parental interference with the uh, suburbs. In the city, uh, parents support you when they say, make my child learn. Mm -hmm. They don't listen to them. How long did you teach? 33 years. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? No. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, yes. Tell us about those. Uh, when I came home, I joined um, the traditional uh, VFW, American Legion. Uh, and then I joined, or as part of founding a new group, uh, it was called VIVA, Vietnam Era Veterans Association. We had a chapter in Framingham. I was the second president for the uh, chapter in Framingham. And then that morphed into uh, what is today VVA, Vietnam Veterans Association. And are you still involved in that? Uh, no, no. 
And when you went back to school, did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I did. And do, have you used any other veterans' benefits over the years? Um, well, that was the main one. I got my uh, finished up my bachelor's and I got my master's uh, on the GI Bill. Did you attend or do you attend any reunions of your old outfit? No, I haven't. I, I would like to. I know some. I'm in the Marine Corps League also. Uh, which that's that's very big and near and dear to my heart. And what about Champion, Mr. Champion? He, uh, we still communicate. Uh, we we didn't for a long time. We uh, we it drifted our separate ways. We were friends when we got home. Um, his father was the fire chief up on Swampscott, and I went up to visit him within the first month that I was home. And his father said, "Would you?" Talk to John, he said, uh, he's still out there a little bit. Because of his experiences? Right. So he had been shot down twice in Vietnam. He got the purple hat. Um, but when I saw him, I, I knew that he was uh, going to do very well. So I reassured his father. I said, don't worry, we're all a little crazy. But uh, I said, your son's going to be fine. Uh, and his son is a CPA now. He's, he's doing fine. He's also working with veterans organizations. Uh, we didn't communicate for 20 years for no real reason. We just kind of drifted uh, separate ways. Uh, he called me up about a disability that he was putting in for the VA. He said, would you uh, write a letter? I said, oh, sure. Uh, then we said, what are you doing? What are you doing type of thing? And he's working with a homeless shelter up in um, Haverhill dealing with veterans. I said, that's funny. I work with the Outreach Center in Marlboro dealing with uh, veterans problems. So we both uh, working with uh, the new veterans now, uh, that we didn't talk to each other about getting involved with this. We just kind of got into it uh, separately. But uh, he said, that's funny that we'd both be involved trying to help these young kids out. What's the difference yeah. between what you all experienced and how you handled it versus today? I, I think the, the major thing was that um, we weren't welcomed when we came home. The, uh, and I've always had this resentment that I was 20 when I finished up, so I couldn't even vote for the people who were sending me over what policies they were implementing while we were there. Uh, but the people in America, and they realized now that they made a mistake, took it out on the veterans coming home. Uh, we were the, uh, the young men and women uh, in the military. We weren't the political figures. So if you wanted to protest something, protest against the president, your senator, your congressman, uh, but they shouldn't have taken it out on us, and they did. And even the World War II veterans resented we were the war that was lost. They didn't welcome us with open arms either. So the World War One, uh, World War II veterans can take a little bit of uh, shame uh, with them also because they weren't that receptive, as they should have been for the newly arriving uh, war veterans. That's why today I'm with the Marine Corps League, I'm the uh, legislative officer at the State House. I monitor legislation for veterans. And I, the first day testifying before a committee on veterans affairs, I explained, I said, when I came home, I said, we were not welcomed uh, by either the people in government or the older veterans. I said, and I resented that. So now, as an older veteran, I want to help these new veterans coming home because they saw that chip in my shoulder. What about Steve Fair? He went on to become a junior engineer for nuclear submarines with the antennas on nuclear submarines, which is a little bit of a stretch from what we were doing. Uh, but then he became very disenchanted with uh, corruption in the way companies were bidding on jobs. He was the uh, negotiator for contracts for some major companies down in Washington. They used defective material or downgraded material from what he had negotiated. Uh, he said, I put my name on this. He said, I, I quit right now. He said, I can't uh, go along with your deception. And he became a guard at the prison up in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. And Do you then, keep in touch with him? Yes, I, I haven't talked to him for uh, over a year now. But uh, he now runs the security at uh, Copley Place. How important to you was serving in the military, and do you feel in some way that it affected, if it affected your life moving forward? 
I think it affected it probably in a positive way in that um, understanding that you go through adversity, uh, the challenge of a war uh, and coming out uh, positively. And I think there's also a commitment to country. I think that that is missing a little bit now. Because when I was in, they had the draft, as I had said earlier, and uh, if you didn't want to be committed to the country, then some people were forced to be committed to the country, but the commitment was there anyway. And if you weren't drafted, there was always that chance that you would be. So you paid attention to what was going on in the country because you may be part of the country more than you wanted to be. Uh, today, uh, nobody has to worry about that. It's all a volunteer force. So the young people, if they don't want to be part of the country, they just say, I never joined that stuff. And they can go to the mall, they can do whatever they want, and not have any strong commitment of their own choosing uh, of the country. Do you have any type of memorable experience, character, or humorous experience that you haven't covered in this interview that you'd like to mention? W one humorous thing. I was out on patrol because I had seen a, the question about that. Um, and we were going through different hooches looking for the enemy. And tell us what a hooch is. A hooch is a, a grass hut. And inside one of the hooches was a wooden candlestick. And under the candlestick was a piece of paper. And we know that the VC had been through the area not too long ago. And I took the paper out, and sure enough, it had uh, words and numbers on there. And even with my Vietnamese, I couldn't comprehend what it said. And I brought it to the Vietnamese colonel. And I thought it was a whole war plan that they had written out. And I presented it to him, waiting for him to say, the war is over now. We know where everybody is. And he said, ah, he said, you should know this. He said, because you know some Vietnamese. I said, I couldn't make out the writing that well. He said, ah, yes. He said, 10 cases of beer, three <laughs> things of ice. <laughs> and it was somebody's grocery list. That, uh, <laughs> that was my attempt to try to end the war. Is there anything else as we wrap this um, interview up that you'd like to share with your family or others who are going to see this tape or any additional comments that you would like to make in closing? Uh, just basically that I was proud of what I had done. Um, I think it was a big factor in my life. And I suppose if I had to do it over again, I would. Well, Warren Griffin, we can't thank you enough. This was a fantastic interview and we appreciate everything you did and you continue to do for our country. Thank you. Thank you very much.